I'm a feminist, uh, but I feel guilty for breaking my third bed of lockdown, uh, which makes it sound far more raunchy than it is. It's breaking just, your uh, bed? You're, you're, yeah. Broke your bed. How many beds have you broken in lockdown? Three. I'm like a professional wrestler. Uh, in so many ways, Deborah. <laughs> I don't think you're wrestling on that bed. Wait, I'm like a professional uh, wrestler, Deborah. Is in I'm not employed at the moment due to lockdown. And <laughs> I've just done a spit take with my diet coke there. Um, <laughs> See, that's what I want. That's the most guilty feminist spit take. Do it with a diet coke. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask? Can I Go ask? On. How have you broken not one but two but three beds, or is this too R rated for this podcast? Look, I'll say it to you in the words of Lionel Richie, right? Once, twice, three times, break in the bed. Um, well, I thought I, you were going to say dancing on the ceiling, and I thought that does track. Yeah, like, that, that, that was one falling way. Falling directly the from the ceiling to the bed. You see, my boyfriend has described my movements just generally as explosive. Like, I make very explosive <laughs> movements. Uh, so I just <laughs> like, I, that what you will. Offline, I'm going to need more information about these bed-breaking incidents. Here's, here's the bed frame. Here's the... <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Is... Yeah. Listen, it's... you're getting great press from this. It's like, I... Alison Spittle, if you're ever single again, and I hope you're not because I love Simon. I if know. If you're ever single again, just this advertisement alone, she broke three beds during lockdown. You are going to be the busiest person on Bumble. The oh, busiest absolutely. woman on Bumble. <laughs> And I mean, then you're like, going to be able to put that on your down. poster as well for Edinburgh. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah. It's just, but like, and maybe we can talk about this at some point for, for our guests as well. I don't have the confidence to like text the landlord because the first time it happens, I was very like, very confident. I was like, excuse me, I would like a new bed. Second time, I was like, please, sir, I need a new bed. Third time, I am Googling like engineering. I'm taking up welding. I need to like find ways to fix my bed. So if any feminists are at home uh, that are a bit handy, hit me up. It's a metal frame bed. I just don't know what to do. Is this because you can't say to the landlord I've broken a third bed? Yeah, because then he'll know about my explosive movements. And uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm sure he'd be impressed. Unless he <laughs> listens to the guilty feminist, but I doubt it. <laughs> Listen, some landlords do. I don't want to assume. I don't want to assume. <laughs> send it, I'll send him a link. Oh. Um, I'm a feminist, but I wish... Ruth Bader Ginsburg had been replaced by a man. Oh. I mean, almost any man, but ideally yeah. a man playing on my team who isn't going to gun down Roe versus Wade and gay rights at the first opportunity. There's so many men that I would have on that Supreme Court over Amy Coney Barrett. Is that her name? If that's even her real name. I don't even want to remember it, Deborah. I just want it to be a quick thing in history. I wouldn't mind if like even like uh, if Matt Lucas replaced her. Because before, when Matt Lucas replaced Sandy Topsquick, I wasn't sure about it. But now I quite like him, you know? So like, <sighs> let's get Matt Lucas into the high judiciary of America. He'd do I a great s- job. I see what you're saying there, actually. Because I was disappointed when Sandy Topsquick was replaced by a man, I have yeah. to say. I felt like we had a famous and quite brilliant queer woman in that role. Mm-hmm. And then she was replaced by a queer man, both white. Bake Off's very white. It's like as white as self-raising flower. I think we need to be very honest. They have diversity mm-hmm. in the contestants, but really not at all. But I was like, oh my God, and now they're having another man. So when Matt Lucas was appointed, I was like, come on guys. Like, you know, but you're right. If Matt Lucas could have replaced Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't know how he'd go on the Supreme Court, how he'd fit in, given that he's not an American judge. Ah, oh, he'd, he'd do a few jokes. He'd bring his personality to it. That's how he's done it with Baker. I don't know. I think a good solution would have been to get RBG and do it like a weekend at Bernie's type thing. And just <laughs> pretend she was alive for about a year. Just... Oh, God. Weekend at Ginsburg's. Exactly. I, I reckon we'd have a better chance of getting Paul Hollywood on the Supreme Court because he's at least a Bake Off judge before <laughs> we get Matt Lucas on. He's just a present. He's a jokester. He's a clown. I just don't think they're going to accept that. Paul Hollywood, I reckon, if they watch the best of Paul Hollywood, yeah, you know, the Hollywood handshake, you know, he holds his approval very tightly. He's a good judge, you know. 
I think they might let him. This is a great suggestion if they do allow more judges on. Mm. I'm a feminist, but I dressed up like a fester from Adam's family uh, last week. So that means putting on a bald cap, putting white stuff all over my face, black under my eyes, a uh, hunch in my back. And I still wanted my boyfriend to find me attractive. <laughs> tried very hard. <laughs> with, with, listen, you've given yeah. Simon a challenge there, but I bet he rose to it. Was one of the times that you broke the bed when you were dressed as Fester? No comment. No okay. comment. All I'm going to say is, Donalana. <laughs> Donalana. <laughs> <laughs> I can say no more, but mm. <laughs> but you know what? Like um, Morticia and Gomez are like the top couple. Have you ever seen the Adams Family films? They're just very attracted to each other. They're very attractive. They're attracted to each other. They've it's got lovely. it going on. Oh, look, they're absolute couples. Goals the spark has not dwindled there. I'm a feminist, but Amy Coney Barrett being nominated to the Supreme Court in all her appallingness. Mm. has made me be ashamed to be a white woman with three names. <laughs> and I'm thinking of dropping a name. I'm thinking Ooh. of just being Deborah Francis because I just think it's ruined it for everyone. I mean, there's Hillary Rodham Clinton. I like her more. I'm trying to think of other people that have blue barrel Camilla names. Parker Bowles. Camilla Parker Bowles. Yeah. Well, like you've said that like it's a triumph. I don't think she's doing much <laughs> sisterhood currently, is she? she? Well, look, she did triumph. She got her man in the end. That's all I'm saying. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> yeah. And I'm back perfect. in the game. There we go. Back in the game. I'm back in the game. I'm a feminist, but I felt most of my self-worth as a woman when I got the shift dressed up like a Mary Bale kissing the Hulk on Halloween. Yeah. I had a lot of green on my face and shifting is Irish for snogging. And I've just been thinking about Halloween a lot this week. And uh, that's one of my best memories is getting me through lockdown. Shifting the Hulk. Shifting the Hulk. Well, like, it wasn't the actual Hulk. It wasn't Mark Ruffalo. It was a fella called John. But, like, he was dressed as the Hulk. So it's, that's the same. That's the yeah. same. It, it, once you're in the costume, it's like shifting Batman. Anyone who's in the costume is Batman, by definition. Absolutely. Batman is not Batman. Batman is just the man in the suit. That's, that's in the story. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but a female friend of mine told me that her new girlfriend is a gynecologist. And my first response was, that's a bit of a busman's holiday for her. <laughs> and what's more, I changed it quickly to bus woman's holiday and felt yeah. proud of myself. That's very good. If you're listening internationally, busman's holiday means when you do your job on your day off. Like in Australia, we say knocking off work to carry bricks. I am very positive about that relationship. That's brilliant. I mean, like, you know, once they're down there, they can check for other stuff. It's two and one. I said, has she ever said Boston Holiday? She said, not with me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Amazing. I'd like it because I just think they can see. I mean, this is so discriminatory of me that I would think a gynecologist would see it differently. This is a guilty feminist. We've got to be guilty. There's still stuff we can be guilty about. I'm How just many saying. Episodes now? This is good. <laughs> I'm just saying. I've just never seen anyone come at me with a speculum and thought, "Oi, oi, <laughs> I'm breaking my bed tonight." Never, never once. You haven't lived, Deborah. I do that twice a week. It's so good. Have you got a final one, Alison? I'm a feminist, but my friend recently broke up with her boyfriend, so I bought her some flowers, some wine, and some sheet masks. Um, truthfully, I don't really care about her boyfriend. I just wanted a sheet mask. So. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. I like doing stuff for a reason. It was good. It was good fun. I've gone over to a friend's house with like pints of Hagen Dazs and Ben and Jerry's and stuff, and got into bed with her and Bailey's. Yeah. But it what that that makes the whole experience much more enjoyable for everybody. Yeah, that? it does. It's like doing a marathon for charity. You know, if you're doing a marathon on your own, you're like, oh, you're doing it for yourself. But if you're doing a sheet mask on your own, you're like, ugh, you're doing it for yourself. But sheet mask with a mate that's broken hearted, you're suddenly a philanthropist. I hear I that. It. I hear that. From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Alison Spittle, and our very special guests, Vic Hope and Kautha, talking about families together. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. Uh-huh. 
Um, <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Alison Spittle and we're talking about families together. Ew. Hello, Alison Spittle. I am very glad to see you on Zoom. This is uh, the most glamorous Zoom conference I've ever been on. I mean, it's quite up there, isn't it? I'm a feminist, but I'm valuing you by your look. So Thank you very much. I had an important Zoom call this afternoon and I wanted to feel, you know, not that this isn't important, Alison, not that I wouldn't have done it for you. Of course. Of but course. I had one of those ones where you need a bit of confidence, put on a bit of lipstick, bit of eyeliner, picked yeah. out an outfit. That's right. I've organised my wardrobe, Alison. So now I've got outfit choices because I can see where everything's hanging. When you say like organised, like uh, what do you mean? Like do you put like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday's underwear? What are we talking about here? Oh, it's not like Legally Blonde or Clueless, oh. where I have a sort of remote control. No, Jessica oh, Regan, no. who's been on the podcast before and does our big speeches workshops, she is also a phenomenal organiser. Uh, she's a professional actress, so she doesn't do it by trade, but she does love a challenge, and I provide such a challenge in terms of organising. I mean, I will, I'm a gauntlet, a thrown down gauntlet. She can't resist. So I said to her, Hey, do you fancy coming over? And yeah. I'll pay you to help me because I'm in such a state with my clothes. And she got colour coordinated coat hangers, Alison, for me. <gasps> Very thin velvet ones that she got from TK Maxx. So now all my dresses are on pink hangers. All my sort of one sorts of tops or whatever are on cream and woolens are on grey, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Jess is going to listen to this and go, stop dismissing my system and saying, oh, something like that. Why have you not learnt the colours? And she's, a, she's been making a good point there. But now I can see everything I've got mm -hmm. and I can piece things together. I can go, oh, I've got a white top and it's not at the bottom of a laundry basket. It's hanging on a hanger facing the right way. That would pair nicely, I think, because I say things like pair nicely now because I've got organised clothes. <laughs> that would pair nicely with a navy cardigan with white trim, I think. This you is see, I, I'm very similar to you except my system is on the floor. And um, the only system I have is what I like to call uh, the Alison Spittle patented sniff test. Right. Which is, uh, if I have to smell it twice, it's not going on me. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's my rule. <laughs> I call that uh, a floor drobe. Love it. I need to put a name on what mm -hmm. I have. And a floor drobe is definitely what I have. This is Deborah briefly interrupting your podcast listening to tell you about some very exciting things. Now we have our fifth anniversary show on the 7th of December at 7.30 p.m. at King's Place with lots of our guilty feminist regulars. The show is sold out, but you can live stream on Zoom and it's going to be a spectacular one with lots of our guilty feminist regulars. It's going to be a big old birthday celebration. Do not miss it. It is going to be a party and watching from home is going to feel almost as wonderful as being in the room. You can get tickets at kingsplace.co.uk or follow the link from guiltyfeminist.com. And now back to the podcast. Our first guest today is a multilingual, multi-award winning TV and radio presenter, journalist and published author. She has won Marie Claire's Future Shapers Broadcasting Powerhouse Award and was named one of Nike's Women Who Changed the Game. She is a human rights activist and an ambassador for Amnesty International and Help Refugees. Choose love. Please welcome Vic Hope. Oh, thank you, Debs. <laughs> she is joined nice. by Kautha, who left her family in Syria when she was just 16 years old. Her mum wasn't well enough to travel, so Kautha went alone to help her family to get the medication her mum needs. She passed through Turkey before spending three years underground in Greece with little support and no education. She arrived in the UK in 2019 and hasn't seen her family for five years. Please welcome Kautha. Hey! Hello. Hello. Hi. So lovely to meet you. Thank you. You too. So, Vic, tell us a little bit about families together. What is the current policy? What do we want it to be? Okay. So, families together is basically a coalition. So it's bringing together about fifty organisations, including Amnesty International, um, the British Red Cross, Refugee Council, UNICEF to call for a change to the rules that are currently in place that keep refugee families apart. So 
currently a child refugee who arrives in this country, if they've been separated from their family, they can't sponsor a parent to then come over and be with them, um, which is fundamentally against the rights in international law of anyone. If someone leaves and sort of comes to the UK, um, we're one of the only countries in Europe that refuses to grant child refugees the right to be reunited um, with even their closest family. And as well as changing that, we also want to reintroduce um, legal aid so that refugees who've lost everything in horrendous situations when fleeing from persecution or war have the support that they need to be able to afford and navigate the complicated process of being reunited with their families. Because I think we can all you know, relate at the moment to the fact that being kept apart from your family, it's, it's a horrendous feeling. And for so many children, it's a feeling that, that has no end in sight. If you've left because you've been persecuted, you've been in a very dangerous situation, and you don't know when you'll ever see your family again, your parents, your brothers, your sisters... It's horrendously frightening, it's dehumanising and, and it needs to change. Yeah, I think we've all had a taste of this now. Like I mm. know if something happened to my mum and I needed to get back to Australia now, there's no flights going directly to Australia anymore. There's, you know, it takes about 40 hours to get there. Then you have to, you also have to apply to be quarantined for two weeks and there's only so many hotel rooms that they've got. So you can't just turn up. Mm. And I'm an Australian citizen and I can't, I don't have any rights to see my mum at the moment, not without some hoops to jump through. And that's the first time that's happened to me. How are your, yeah. how's, what's your situation, Alison, with your family? Um, yeah, so I'm in a similar position to you. I live in London at the moment and uh, I went back to Ireland in August and I took quarantine for two weeks and then visit my mum. And with Christmas, um, Ireland's gone up to level five. So they're on a strict lockdown at the moment and I'm just not sure whether my ticket will get me over to Ireland. And um, yeah, I'm just not sure what I'm doing for Christmas. I was thinking about this, about how kind of sad and inconvenienced I felt. And I was like, it's nothing compared to to people that have, you know, where their lives are on hold. Because I feel like my life is on hold. I can't say to my mum, I'm definitely coming home for Christmas. So I don't know if I am or not. Um, I read an article the other day uh, that articulated something that I felt a lot of us have felt, but not really be able to find the words to describe that said that we're in this situation of horizonlessness. So all the things that we used to look forward to, whether it was seeing our friends and family or whether it was working towards a job promotion or you know Christmas. making money to be able to buy something nice or Christmas, we have these things in the future that we can place value on. And when that's taken away from us and there's this uncertainty, we don't know what's happening next, we don't know when it's going to end, we're left feeling so bereft because we don't know how to look forward to things anymore or to be excited They described it as horizonlessness and it made a really good point about how what we can place value on is something that's not going to change is a sense of solidarity and togetherness and support. And I think that's why this campaign is so important because what is being stripped away from so many people who've come to this country and might have been separated from their families is that chance of solidarity, support and togetherness with the people they need the most, who love them the most and who they love the most. That's what we've got amongst everything that's going on, amongst all of this horizonlessness that we're all feeling now, is we've got to have each other. That yes. is such a great description. That's such that you do just place. You know, I didn't have words for this before, and now it feels like someone said it out loud and you process <laughs> it a bit better. Mm-hmm. And you know, listen, we shouldn't need to walk in someone else's shoes to empathise with them. But you know, this experience for all of us, like, you know, it's scary. And like, even you know, we're in that first stage of lockdown. It didn't matter if your mum was living next door; you weren't allowed to see her or whatever. Yeah. You know, like everyone's had an experience or a taste of this. Everyone except mm-hmm. Dominic Cummings has had a taste mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, now, and you know, but not all of us had to get our eyes tested. So you know, That's we true. We, didn't, we didn't all damn have my the... twenty twenty vision. <laughs> exactly. That's a whole new meaning to twenty twenty vision. <laughs> Literally, yeah. um, <laughs> I wish it had it. <laughs> It just, you know, but we've all had this experience now. And actually now I take that and think, because now we know, okay, there's going to be an end. It will, you know, at some point these restrictions will be lifted. At some point we'll get a handle on COVID. You know, we know that most of us will see our family again unless something tragic happens, which of course has happened to people, you know. Um, But imagine now not knowing if you're ever, ever going to see your family again. And imagine if they're in a war zone or in some kind of really traumatic place and you don't know whether they're 
alive or not today or, you know, what you can't get through to them. And imagine there's no end in sight and you can't get them where you are as desperate as you are to get them. And imagine it's actually your sister or your mum or your dad or your brother or your sister or kid or whatever. Imagine you're a child and you can't get your parents out. Like it's just now we've all understood it by having a small taste of it, we can magnify that in our mind. And I think, you know, people say, oh, you shouldn't have to experience it, but it helps. It does help. And here we have experience. Kautha, can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Um, So you're from Syria. Yes, yeah. So can I ask you um, for your story, when did you come to the UK um, and how did you come here alone without your family? Yeah, I came last year. And then I left my family when I was 16 years old. I traveled from Syria to Turkey with my mom. And then I left her there uh, to go to uh, to European country, like uh, in Greece first. And then I stayed to Greece three years. I left Greece and, and then to travel to UK. I came to Portugal and then to UK. And are you living in London now? Yes, yeah. Can I ask where your mum is and how she is? My mum is here in Syria. And then she's not feeling like a well to time, all the time because she had like some operation in her brain. And then it's making her so tired, so like uh, worries. And then she cannot move, she cannot like walk along. She have to depend on someone with her because like uh, one uh, blood in her brain is stopped. She feel all her body. She cannot uh, like uh, walk or like to talk in so much things. And how long have you been separated from your family now? How long has it been since you've seen them? It's taken now five years. Five years. How, yes. how do you contact them, Katha? Only in the WhatsApp, by messages or voice messages. Sometimes Can you see them on yeah. FaceTime? Yeah. But uh, not all the time because the networks there is not like uh, very good. Yes, mm. and uh, it's a war zone, so you know it, it, that's it, it yes. presumably comes and goes. How does that make you feel? Like it's, I'm not feeling like excited or because I feel sometimes very bad when I'm alone. Not like I'm far away from them. I miss them a lot because of oh, I'm feel sure. very bad. But, I'm sure. What do you miss most about being with your family? I miss to see my mom, to like uh, see her, talk with her, say what I want, so many things. Okay. And what will you do when you see your mom again? Uh, I I want to hug her too much. And then I want to like, I don't know, feel my mom when I see her has come the life to me. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, how can the Home Office make family reunion easier for people? Just if that one is going to change the rules to like be any age, the legal age, to just uh, bring the family, not like uh, uh, under the 16 or 18, to just bring the family. Is that one allowed to bring them? Well, right now, even children can't. But you left as a child. And I know that psychologists say that having your attachments disrupted, having the people who are closest to you taken away as a child, you know, it really affects you. It's one of the most difficult things a child can go through. So your courage and your ability to, you know, sit here and be interviewed on a a Zoom is incredible. Yeah. Are you, what are you doing at the moment? Are you at school? You're studying. I'm really glad. Yeah. I'd like to get to know you better in real life. Yeah. Um, what are you studying? What, uh, what uh, like filling you with joy at the yeah, moment? I, uh, I study language and the creative design. Creative design? <gasps> yes. Oh, right. So talk to me about creative design because I went to school in Ireland and we did none of that. So mm-hmm. I want to hear like what creative design is like for you. Yeah, uh, we're doing a digital and then right. 3D and drawing. Right. Okay. Amazing. Yes. Oh, is that what you'd like to do when you yes. leave school? Yes, yeah. <laughs> I like it so much. Will you but, be like a graphic designer, do you think? Or a web yeah, designer? Yes, yeah. I want to be an interior designer in the future for the home, office, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, like uh, to mix our colors, to uh, doing like a new new ship, something like that. I got a bit of advice for you, and it's my big pet hate about uh, hotels, right? 
you know what I love? If you ever go to a hotel, sometimes if you sit on the toilet and I'm not like, and you open the door, you can see the television. Like, I don't know why hotels design it like that, but it's so <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, you so have when, a, yeah, so many chance to sit a white lab and the car is not nice there. Uh, some of the chairs no good, like a design decoration, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's so cool. Because, you know, like, or, or plugs beside the bed. I hate it oh. when hotels don't have plugs beside the bed. <laughs> Like, that's rule number one, I think, for interior design for hotels. Like, that's so cool. I am so with you. Kalsa, like when you one. designed the interior of hotels, could you please insist <laughs> we need two PowerPoints beside the bed so we can plug our phone in and things like that? Not on the other <laughs> side of the room next to a desk. How do I wake up in the morning? This whole thing has to be rethought. I love what you're wearing, by the way. I would absolutely get you to do a bit of interior design for me because I'm, yeah. I'm loving you. Come on in leopard skin chic there. Not a real leopard skin, just to be clear to our listeners. <laughs> um, but leopard skin print is very glamorous. Well, I'm very excited to meet you. I actually have someone I want you to meet yeah. who is Syrian. Yes. And he has also not seen his family for five years. And he lives with my husband and me. And he is 100% our family. He moved in with us three years ago. Mm. Uh, we just had our third year anniversary. His name is Steve. But that's short for Mustafa, so you will know him more as Mustafa because that's obviously yes, you're suspicious I, uh, of why I have a friend called. Yeah. Called, what was that? Yeah, almost Arabic. Yeah. People like the same like Mustafa Muhammad. This is name. He <laughs> says this. He Steve yeah. has like a hundred friends, and they have three names between them. Oh, okay. <laughs> he always says there's no names. There's no names. So Mustafa is. Uh, he says quite unusual as names go. So let me just call him one okay. second because he wants to meet you, Mustafa. Also, unbreakable beds. That's another uh, recommendation for design. <laughs> Just to say. Unbreakable beds. Yes, Alison Special has a habit of breaking beds. Oh, there's Steve. Oh, there's so many people. Oh, there's so many people. Hold on. Can I give... Oh, St Steve's getting headphones now. He's getting set up. This is my new uh. friend, Kalfa, who's yeah. from Syria, and she's not seen her family in five years, same as you. Hello. Hi. What would you say? Your name? Ka Hello. My name's Kalfa. Oh, Kalfa, right? My cousin's yeah. called Kalfa. That's a very old, kind of rare name, really. Is it? Old, yeah. rare name? It's like Margaret or something. Right. Ah. Yeah. But it's a very nice name. <laughs> I would like to catch up with you on the last 10 years and what's been happening, but I mean... Where are you from, uh, Syria? I'm yeah. from Damascus. Uh, me, Holmes. <laughs> Holmes, oh, okay. Yeah. You're like next door. Yes, yeah, nearby. <laughs> Do you have any Syrian friends in London, Katha? Yeah, because I just one year and a half I'm here, I I don't have like too much friends. Steve, Katha doesn't have any Syrian friends. Can you fix this? Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I know some, I know a lot of Syrians here, so I would love to introduce you to them. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk to the Syrians. I don't know if you want to talk to the Syrians. Ah, oh, tamam, basit. Ah, I'm gonna, I don't know, if you, not gonna understand if you speak Arabic. I don't know. If you That's okay. Oh, That's I okay. speak fluent yeah. Arabic now, don't I, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> I mean, Habibi. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, Wallahi. Oh yes. I've, I've, I've got two, two words. Steve's been living for three years. His English has got better and better. His English is better than mine now, though. He corrects my English all the time. <laughs> How many years are here? Oh, three years. Three years. In the UK, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Do you like cats, Katha? Uh, yes, but I like panda more than that. Panda. Pandas. Pandas. I, I can't help you with a panda. When we're allowed to have you over, because at the moment we're not allowed, but when we're allowed to have you over, I can facilitate you with cats. I have very limited panda action in the flat. Um, but, uh, are but, open. That's all I'm saying. You can meet up in the zoo. Steve, oh, yes. Oh, we live near the we live near, live near the Regent's Park Zoo. We'll take you to the zoo to see some pandas. But Steve has a cat called Damascus. Yeah. Oh. And it has its own Instagram account. I'm going to send it to you because I want you to be friends with Steve and his Syrian friends okay, because maybe. Steve is my family. Yeah. <laughs> and I think family is partly a state of mind. You yeah. can decide to be family with people. Okay. So while you're waiting for your family to come here, you can be part of ours. Yeah, I hope so. That would be great. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll leave you for now and talk to you at some point. No soon, hopefully. All right. Yeah, thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Kalsa's going to be a interior designer. She could help you with your room to organise and sort out your room. 
Sure. <laughs> Marie Kondo. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't let me... His room is very cluttered. He said recently he heard that Britain's biggest hoarder died and so he thinks there's a position open. <laughs> <laughs> True story, true story. It's actually very beautiful what he's done. It looks kind of quite Instagrammy because there's lots mm. of his treasures from his travels laid out, but he just has a lot of stuff. And I try and get him to do Marie Kondo and he just went, I was like, oh, Katha could help you. And he's like, bye. <laughs> just no one's allowed to touch his stuff or like tidy it. But I feel like you could win him over, Katha. I truly believe that. I win. <laughs> just when I finish studying. Yes. Finish. You don't need to. Just use him to practice on. It's, well, you'll, yeah. love it. you'll love it. You yeah, yeah, I would. <laughs> He won't he won't love it, but uh, he misses his little sisters, so I'm sure he would love to get to know you better. And there's so many different ways of being family with people, and I don't think it is just about biology, but the people that have raised you are mm. never not going to be your number one important people in the world mm. unless there's extenuating circumstances. And I think it just seems so tragic that people are kept apart when they've already been through so much trauma. Vic... What is it that we can do to tell the government that we want to be with our families and we get that and we've experienced a loss of that and we understand that people who've been traumatised don't want to live for the rest of their lives never knowing if they'll see their families again? No. No, everyone should be given the chance to rebuild their lives so they can have a safe future and a happy future. Everyone deserves safety so yeah, the campaign Families Together, it's calling for a change to the rules, as we said, to make safe and legal routes available so that fewer people will feel compelled to make dangerous channel crossings, right? So we make the whole situation <laughs> fairer from the outset. So if you are interested in getting involved and you want to help us put pressure on the government we and do. To change their rules, it's really easy. You can go to familiestogether.uk or you can go to www.amnesty.org.uk forward slash families together. And there's a petition on there. So we're getting as many people on board as possible, as many signatures as possible to show the government that we understand how important this is and how if we were in that situation, we'd also want our family to be able to be reunited. We should have compassion, like you said before, Deborah. We should have love for one another. We, we must be kind to one another. And this is a way that we can show that kindness. So, yeah, if you go to familiestogether.uk or amnesty.org.uk, you can find out how you can help out. And wherever you live in the world... If you could join Amnesty, because they will be fighting for similar things wherever you are. So don't think, oh, well, this is the UK. It doesn't apply to me. No. Very few countries are open to reuniting uh, refugees with their families. And all of them have issues that Amnesty are fighting. So please add your voice. Just join Amnesty and follow them on socials. And you can become part of this big army this choir with voices because you think oh what can I do I'm just a drop in the ocean but when all of the drops get together we can make waves so join Amnesty it's a very simple thing you can do follow Choose Love repost donate even if you've only got a quid or even if you can't donate but you know people who can and you can share it with them and do the actions because it costs nothing to do the Amnesty actions they take about 60 seconds each you add your voice <laughs> and governments are all the time embarrassed and pressured all the time into, Amnesty, into changing things they do so much I remember when I was um about 16 years old and we first learned in RS about prisoners of conscience and it made me so angry I remember hearing about these people who were being persecuted tortured killed for peacefully standing up for what they believed in and just being outraged and asking my RS teacher how can we help what can we do and she introduced me to Amnesty International and we would sit every Thursday afternoon in the RS classroom writing letters to governments putting pressure on them so that they would have to change because we're raising a profile for the atrocities that are happening. And in so many instances, it did work. That pressure did amount to tangible change. Amnesty, they are so strategic. They are so to the letter. They do what they purport to do, what they set out to do. So I have faith. And I think you've got to have optimism. We've got to, we've you've got to got believe to. that tangible change is coming. And um, yeah, I, I feel optimistic and positive that hopefully our world will it will improve, things will get better. We absolutely have to and come together and make it happen. If there's enough of us, then we can make a change. Katha, is there anything you came to say today that you didn't get to say that you would like to say? I wish to ask your mom like a like day to see her uh, not long time, I think. And then, I don't know, I feel like 
cannot explain about what I want to say because something is hard to say about that. Well, like, look, just I wish to I see him. Of course, of course, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah, I knew, like, you know, I take a like, long time just to see her, like. Yeah, and there's no substitute for that yeah. at all. I was reading that she needs certain drugs because she's got a condition with her brain. Yes. And those drugs have to be smuggled over the border because they're illegal in Syria. And mm -hmm. so it's a danger to the family every time they get the drugs through. And can you imagine trying to get the drugs over the border from Turkey to Syria yes. at the moment? And Syria has been at war for nearly 10 years now, longer than the Second World War. People forget that. And mm. we are supplying arms to them. There's no way this war can keep going on. They can't be making all of these arms. These arms are coming from Western countries. We are part of this and we are culpable or our governments are culpable. So we need to send strong messages to them. And Kautha's an ordinary young woman who left as a minor, who wants to be an interior designer, who has hopes and dreams and just wants to hug her mom. That's what this is. That's all this is. It's no more than that. It's no more scary than that. It's no more ununderstandable than that. It's just as human as that. Think of the people in your life who you love. Think of the children you, in your life you love, the teenagers, the people in your life who are doing their GCSEs like Kautha's about to do. Think of those people and then imagine they can't see their mum and they don't know when they'll be able to and their mum's sick and they can't get the medication through and it's terrifying. And then that's who you're helping. But in the meantime, Kautha, I'd love you to have my number. And if you need anything, I can be a sort of substitute big sister okay. while you're waiting. I don't, mind. I don't mind. And Steve will definitely be a big brother to you because he knows Syrians here. And you can just chat to him in Arabic as well. I think it's really exhausting talking to no someone else's language all the time. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think he would love that. Yeah. And also secretly Marie Kondo his room without him noticing. <laughs> <laughs> secretly, secretly. Vic, is there anything you came to say today that you didn't get to say? I just want everyone to be kind to one another, but also be kind to themselves. The world sometimes feels overwhelming. Um, when you first came on the call, Deborah, you were like, you know, I'm having one of those days. Sometimes it's difficult. But if we can help people have a slightly less difficult time, then we should. So yeah, I just hope that Kalfa's story there, I know you said again, you shouldn't need to put yourself in someone's shoes, but sometimes it does help. I hope that Kalfa's story has touched you and I'm pretty sure it will have done. So Kalfa, I really hope that you get to hug your mum as well. And I believe you will. And one more time, families together. Dot UK, or you can go to amnesty.org.org forward slash. So if you could amnesty. pause this podcast maybe now and quickly do that. And then start it up again, because otherwise you might forget because everyone's very busy. Um, <laughs> or even just write it down, pop it up on your phone and just so that it's there waiting for you and you're reminded. <clears throat> It'll also be in the show notes. Vic Hope, it is lovely. We're both Amnesty Ambassadors and I feel like yeah. we should know each other better than we do. Can we but have I a I only picture? became one during the pandemic, so we've not had a chance to... I know. To meet in person, but one day. <laughs> no, normally one day you go, we, we normally we go to Amnesty and we have a, yeah. a glass of wine and toast to new ambassadors, but um, that's been, it's been so little toasting in 2020. We can do a virtual toast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Today, playing us out, we have the incredible musician, Ranjana Gartak. Ranjana, hello. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about the song you're singing? Sure. It's a song from uh, my recent album called The Butterfly Effect. Um, the words are by a female mystic called Mirabai, who was around in the 15th century. And she brought a lot of people together through her words of love for the universe and for the divine and she saw everything as sort of the beloved in a way and the divine as the beloved and people were said to experience a lot of heart opening and healing through hearing her poetry and songs so I composed a song to one of her poems with two other great musicians called Liran Donin and Jack Ross um, there's a video for it as well on YouTube so I'll to plug that <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, yeah so that's the a kind of acoustic version of that song that I'll be doing. Wonderful. Take it away, Ranjana. So exciting. Thank you. <clears throat> hmm. 
कैसे जादू डायरी कैसे जादू डायरी अब तूने कैसे जादू डायरी अब तूने कैसे जादू डायरी कैसे जादू डायरी रे कैसे जादू डायरी मोर मुकुट पीतांबर शोभे मोर मुकुट पीतांबर शोभे कुंडल की छवि न्यारी कुंडल की छवि न्यारी जादू डायरी रे कैसी जादू डायरी रे कैसी जादू डायरी Absolutely brilliant. And that's you from so your much. album The Butterfly Effect? Yes. Uh and oh, we man. can download that. Yeah, it's on Bandcamp and iTunes and all the streaming. Right. Uh websites. so and where can we follow you? I'm on Instagram, Rantana Gatak, and Twitter as well. And yeah. Vic Hope, where can we follow you? On Instagram, I guess, Vic and Hope. Yeah, and I do a, an advice show for young people um on Radio 1 on Sunday afternoons called Life Hacks. from 4 Wonderful. till 7. So everything from mental health to racism to relationships to sex, we discuss it, everything that affects young people. We all need so, more yeah. hope in 2020 and uh, <laughs> following Vic Hope is one way to get it. And uh, tune into her on Sunday afternoon if you live in the UK. Alison Spittle, do you have anything to plug? I do. So I got a uh, Instagram and Twitter at Alison Spittle, but there is a thing I want to plug and it's it for the theme of families together. There is a petition uh, going on in Ireland at the moment. Um if you just type in repeal the seal you can find it on Twitter and it's uh, pressuring the government not to seal up records that will uh prevent children from finding their birth parents um there's been a big problem in Ireland with institutional mother and baby homes and uh there's 150,000 people that have signed it already and it would be great to get some more because the government really does need to be pressured to stop doing it and also Debenhams workers have been striking for 200 days in Ireland They're working class older uh, women and I feel that they would be listened to a lot more if they weren't, you know. So that's my two things I want to plug. So that's it. Great. And it doesn't matter if we're Irish or not, we can still campaign yeah. the government to yeah, repeal the seal. Yeah, they should they need to be pressured. They need to be told. And Irish people, we love hearing from other countries telling us that we're great. And so I'd say if we're told that we're bad, we'd react to it as well. Yeah. I mean, I found my biological family mm -hmm. and if someone had tried to stop me and sealed it up like in australia you just the government will just give you the information if you want it and i they think they want to seal it up for 30 years they're basically waiting for these women that have been in institutions to die because these I are women know. in their 70s 80s in ireland uh, if you were unwed there was a good chance you'd be put into a mother and baby home where you gave birth and then you um the child was given away and you could go back to your life uh, without the child and um what has happened is that the records of those mother and baby homes the government want to seal them for 30 years they say it's a gdpr thing uh, oh but the, come on <laughs> gdpr 
But the families that have been affected by this are begging the government uh, not to seal up these records. And to be honest with you, I'm not the best. Like, the problem with me is I'm a person that's passionate but not great at reading up on stuff. So there are people that know way more than me. But if you look at the hashtag repeal the seal, uh, you'll find out all the information there. Okay, so repeal the seal (laughs) and also complain to Debenhams because old working class women are on strike and no one is doing anything about it. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis white guest co-host Alison Spittle, and our very special guests, Vic Hope and Kalthar, with music from Rangela Gattak. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. and the producer was Tom Solinsky for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Rachel Kraft, Regina DCO, and everyone who made this episode happen, as well as all of you for listening. More information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Woo! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm uh, just excited to see people. I'm I mean, good. it's just a delight, nice, isn't it? Yeah. To make eye contact or what, what passes for eye contact on Zoom. So deeply perverted. Like, like they have found something deep and dark within my uh, Google. Uh, within, Oh, wait there. I just said Google and then my phone turned on. No. I swear down. <laughs> swear down. Smoke. E. Putin is listening to me. Get, oh, wait. Now he wants to play a song called Swear Down. No. Be quiet, Google. Stop listening to me. Oh, they do listen. They're listening all the time. Okay. You know yeah, yeah, go on. I Googled Putin today uh, for a uh, project I'm working on. And then I was afraid that, like, Putin would know that I Googled him. And then would, like, <laughs> turn on my camera and watch me, like, picking my nose and film it or something <laughs> and hold that over me. It, I wouldn't put it past. Him. That's all I'm saying. And no. I'm not going to work for uh, Russia then. Nothing about 2020 would surprise me. Have you got an I'm a feminist, Alison Spittle? I do, I do.